Kushina Uzumaki was one of the first casualties of the Naruto series. Dead on the day of her son's birth, the former Jinchuriki had the tailed beast within her ripped out and used to attack the village. This left Naruto alone and with nobody. Orphaned, he had nobody in the world. Minato had hoped for Hiruzen to take care of him, but Hiruzen was a real hands-off caretaker, pretty much letting Naruto do whatever he pleased, whenever he wanted. Only stopping by to check up on him occasionally and making sure that he wasn't doing anything dangerous, like drinking expired milk. Naruto's actions, early childhood, and much of his personality are owed to his self-raised style, with even Sakura mentioning that due to Naruto's lack of parents, he was rather wild and did things that commonly society would think uncouth. However, I always wondered what would have happened if Kushina had survived the loss of her tailed beast. I mean, it isn't impossible. One could argue that Kushina knew her limits. But let's stop and remember for a moment that Kushina was both an Uzumaki and was also alert at the time of losing Kurama. Naruto, upon losing Kurama, was in far worse shape, unresponsive, his heart having to be manually pumped by Sakura, and he still came back with the introduction of Kurama's other half to his body. One could argue his recovery was based on Six Paths Chakra, but the point remains that it is feasible that Kushina could have survived if she had Kurama resealed back into her. So for now, let's follow that line of thought and see how it might affect the Naruto world. Welcome to the Amagi. Before we begin, we publish a new video every day, so be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. We've noticed that a lot of our viewers aren't actually subscribed to our channel. So if you want to get the latest videos as soon as possible, and if you really want to help us out, make sure you hit that subscribe button. The Amagi's reach stretches beyond just this channel, so if you're a fan of us, please consider subscribing to our other channels and following us on all of our social media. Help us reach our goal of passing 100,000 followers on all of our accounts by the end of the year. Kushina and Minato were within the barrier and Kurama was attacking them, attempting to free himself from their grasp, longing for the freedom stolen from him all of those years ago by Madara Uchiha and Hashirama Senju. A slave to man, the tailed beast longed for freedom, freedom and retribution. But Minato, knowing that the balance of power between nations that Hashirama had set up those years earlier, as well as the balance between the tailed beast, was in jeopardy, he resolved to seal it away. Kushina believed that placing the beast inside of her would allow her to drag it to the grave with her, but in a single moment of clarity, Minato began to believe it was not so. So, weaving the hand signs, he began to perform the sealing that his ailing wife was too weak to do. Snake, boar, ram, rabbit, dog, rat, bird, horse, snake. Clapping his hands together, the monstrous form of the Shinigami appeared, bearing in its mouth a sharp dagger. Kurama panics. Minato uses the power of the Shinigami to drag Kurama's soul out and plant it back into Kushina. Upon doing so, Kushina would feel her strength returning and she would revive, but this was not so for Minato. Having sacrificed his life for his family, he fell to his knees limp. Kushina would rush over to check on him and see if there was a way to save him. Of course, there was not, and she knew that. It was she who had taught him this technique, and currently she wished that she hadn't. She held him close. Minato! Minato! He would look at her with a slight smile. Take care of... His eyes would roll up and then he was gone. He wasn't sad though, he was happy. His role as a husband and father was completed. He just wished that he could stay with them and enjoy their lives. But the Shinigami was not merciful to any. Minato's sacrifice saved the village, his son, and his wife. Due to this, Naruto remains a normal boy and Kushina remains alive. She would be transported to the hospital with her child. Physically, she's together, but emotionally, she's in tatters. Makoto Uchiha appears with Sasuke and Itachi to check up on her and ask if she was okay, but the look on her face told them everything they needed to know. Minato was gone and she was left alone to raise a child, her first child. Mikoto would decide that the best way to help her was to be the friend that she was and help her in any time that she needed advice on child rearing or a shoulder to cry on. And that is exactly what she got. For a few years, Sasuke and Naruto grow closer together as Mikoto and Kushina spend more time together. Every so often, Itachi is there and plays with them. They become a band of brothers, but this, like so many other things, doesn't last forever. The Uchiha begin planning an uprising after the blame for the deaths of so many people were pinned on them. The Sharigan left present in the eyes of the Ninetales as the attack happened. The Uchiha were blamed, and the likes of Danzo, who viewed the Uchiha as a threat, began to push them away. 
isolating them from the village and leaving them to rot in a forgotten corner of Konoha. Kushina was at home with Naruto, fixing something to eat when word came out that the Uchiha had been eradicated. She was surprised, and even more surprised to hear that it was Itachi. How could he? It should have been impossible. Itachi was not a greedy boy, nor was he prideful or angry. He was the definition of sweet pea growing up. He had so much skill and potential, but he never once displayed any sign that he could slaughter his own clan, his family no less. Kushina would cry tears of sorrow upon hearing of the murders of Fugaku and Makoto. She would look back to see if there had ever been any cries for help. She remembered the last time she saw Itachi. He and a friend named Shisui were there trying to get her to contact the Konoha Council on the matters to try and sway the opinions of both the Hokage and Itachi's father. But neither worked, and she was shut down on both occasions by those she tried to contact over it. That must have been the turning point for Itachi. Had he killed the Uchiha to protect the village? She would storm into the Hokage's office and demand if Hiruzen had commanded Itachi to kill the Uchiha. Hiruzen, in the middle of a meeting, would have to wave out the entourage and silently wait to answer. His lack of words spoke volumes, though. Kushina was angered and sorrowful and disgusted. She couldn't pin it down to one emotion. You did it. You ordered him to, didn't you? Hiruzen would respond by telling her that he didn't know until it was far too late. Military action was considered, but that he hadn't made any definite decision. He then reveals to her as a friend that someone else on the council commanded it to happen. Donzo Shimura, the leader, or former leader of Root. He would say that Donzo commanded it to happen and that Itachi was indeed acting under orders, attempting to save the world from a new war. Kushina couldn't believe it. She said that there had to be another way. Hiruzen would admit it was handled poorly, and due to such a thing, Danzo was removed as leader of Root, and the entire organization was shut down. Kushina asked if that was all that happened, if there was more coming. Hiruzen shook his head. Kushina asked where Itachi was now, and Hiruzen stated that he had left in exile, going to the Akatsuki as a mission to spy on them for Konoha. Kushina was awestruck, wondering how, after this, they could ask even more of him. She pointed in Hiruzen's face and straightly said that Minato would never have let such a thing happen. He would have never let this slide either. Hiruzen sat silently, feeling the shame he so richly deserved. Kushina demands to know if there were any survivors, and Hiruzen tells her that Sasuke was spared by Itachi, who seemingly couldn't bring himself to kill him. Kushina would demand to know his location, and Hiruzen would command that she be taken to him. Hiruzen asked Kushina to keep it quiet, and was only met by the scornful stare of the red-hot habanero of the leaf. She would be taken to Sasuke, who would be standing there, expressionless and emotionless. He didn't react to anything she said. He only ever looked at her when she dropped down to his level, to which his eyes would look into hers, and Kushina could see the trauma in him. His eyes reddened and irritated from crying, from awakening his Sharingan. She would almost be driven to tears looking at him. She would pull him into her embrace, but he didn't respond further. She would choose to adopt him, and the moment anyone said different, she would make her classic Medusa face, something that told them just how strongly she felt about this. Taking his little hand, she would walk back to her house. Opening the door, she would step in to find Naruto still napping in his room. She would sit down with Sasuke on the couch and just coddle him, hoping that in some way her motherly affections might crack that barrier of ice that was threatening to overtake him. She didn't care if he laughed or if he cried. She didn't care what he did, so long as he did something. So long as he acknowledged his emotions like she was doing in liberal fashion currently. She would hold him close and kiss his head, telling him that everything would be alright. Still, he didn't respond. At about that time, Naruto would be peeking around the corner. Sasuke's here, he would say with wonder as he rarely saw him at this point in the day, and never without Mikoto. Kushina would smile and try to hide her tears and wave him in. Naruto would come over and crawl onto the couch. Hi Sasuke, what are you doing here? Kushina would clear her emotion-stricken throat and speak. Sasuke's going to be staying with us now. Naruto didn't understand it. Does his mommy not love him anymore? Sasuke would suddenly shove Naruto off the couch. Naruto would hit the floor and look back with both confusion and tears in his eyes, not sure why his friend had done that. Looking back, he would see Sasuke's emotionless face staring at him, only the slightest hint of a tear in his eyes. Kushina would help Naruto stand back up and check to make sure he was okay. She would wipe the tears slowly rolling down his cheeks and bring him back to the couch, this time sitting him on the other side of her, away from Sasuke. Kushina would state that Sasuke was staying with them now because she loved him and his mom couldn't take care of him anymore because of an accident. Naruto seemed to understand at this point that something bad had happened and that Sasuke was sad. 
Naruto would crawl over Kushina just to give Sasuke a hug and apologize for whatever happened that he didn't know about. Kushina would pull them both into her embrace, hearing the muffled groanings of Sasuke as he attempted to deny his quivering lip. She would tell him it was okay to cry and that she was sad too. From that point, Sasuke broke down. He wailed and cried, shattering whatever was left of Kushina's heart into even smaller shards. Naruto was not yet as emotionally conscious, so he wasn't crying at all, but his hug conveyed a warmth and stability that Sasuke needed, a way of telling him that there was no need to cry because everything would be better. This didn't stop Sasuke though. The rest of the day was hard. Sasuke wasn't hungry and didn't eat. Naruto cleaned his plate today as he would any other day, and Kushina, well, she wouldn't eat if Sasuke didn't. So she would put them both down for the night, tucking them both into their bed and reading them a nice story, which Sasuke seemed to mostly ignore. She would dim the lights. Naruto conked out almost immediately, but Sasuke didn't even close his eyes, just picking his nails and staring at the wall. Kushina would wait there as long as she needed. She would stroke his head until drowsiness seemed to take over. Once he was asleep too, she would leave the room, closing the door behind her. Moving to her room, she would change out of her dress that she'd been wearing, but instead of changing into her pajamas as she normally would this time of night, she changed into a set of dark clothes before slipping on her sandals and zipping up an old flak jacket. Leaving her house, she began to make her way across the rooftops, keeping watch as she moved for any who might recognize her. This wasn't something she normally did, and truth be known, she had mostly resigned from her post as a Konoha shinobi when she married Minato and became pregnant with Naruto. She avoided the gaze of the civilians and the other Konoha ninja as she moved. She eventually came to a stop at the abandoned compound where the Uchiha had once been. She stepped in and was overtaken by the potent scent of metal from the blood. While the bodies were gone, the stains left from the wounds were still there in the dirt, awaiting a summer rain to wash them away. She stayed on guard, but didn't bother being too cautious, as she was a member of the Leaf and still technically a shinobi, meaning she had every right to be there. She wanted to investigate. It wasn't about figuring out why or who anymore, but how. She wanted to know how they did it, and further, where they were. Her good friends lived in this village, and she had watched over Sasuke for many years after his birth, as Makoto wanted to continue her shinobi career alongside Fugaku. They were basically family to her, and they had been ripped from her in a cruel and gruesome way. Even if there was a coup planned, there was no reason to target non-combatants, women, and children while pacifying the revolt. That was tantamount to a war crime, and had been committed by the village's own leadership. She wanted to expose this to the village and force accountability by the government. The Uchiha, Itachi, and even little Sasuke all deserved that much. As she skulked through the streets, she'd find herself before the home of Fugaku, the clan head. She would enter the building. It was dark and cool as the summer night's wind blew through the open shoji screen doors. Looking about, she saw a set of footprints, shinobi footwear tracking blood down the stairs. Itachi's shoes. The stairs creaked as she went up them. Reaching the top, she found a hall with many rooms. She entered one and found so much blood that it looked like a butcher's shop. The smell of blood was so thick that it nearly choked her. Making it to Fugaku's desk, she began to look through his papers. Invoices, reports, anything that a clan head would normally have. But what she was really searching for was anything on the Anbu Black Ops, specifically the Root Division. She wouldn't find too much in the way of info on Root. They were good. Too good. But she would also check Itachi's room. He would have zero information on Anbu, as anything he was given to read was required to be destroyed after he had finished reading it. At a loss, she attempted to remember her husband's connections and would make her way back home for the night where she would rest and consider her next plan. Not long thereafter, she would take the next chance she received to go out on the town and speak with those she knew about the Anbu. The first person she would go to contact being Kakashi Harake, who had recently been released from the Anbu by Hiruzen. She would contact him and invite him out for lunch. Kakashi would show up, cautious but intrigued. Kushina would begin by making small talk and trying to seem as if she were attempting to just catch up with an old friend, but Kakashi wasn't buying it. He had never been close with Kushina. Why would she want to see him? He would ask her directly what she wanted, and Kushina, feeling as if his Sharingan were peering straight into her mind, would speak frankly. I want information on Root. Kakashi would ask why she was looking for Root, and she would state that she had hoped to learn the truth behind the Uchiha massacre. Kakashi would state that the simple truth was that Itachi had killed them. Kushina would state that she knows it isn't true and would like to know where there's a base. Since Root is disbanded, she wants to find their base of operations and take a look through their papers and scrolls. 
Kakashi states that even if Root is disbanded, they're still part of the Anbu, and as such, everything they did was classified on the highest level. It wasn't something that she, even the widow of the former Hokage, could just get her hands on. He would tell her to just forget about it and go home, but Kushina would stand. They made him do it, she would say. They forced Itachi to kill them. Kakashi would look back. What did you say? She would continue. There was a coup planned. Hiruzen was making plans to deal with it peacefully, and Root commanded Itachi to slaughter them all, including the women and children. Only Sasuke survives, and he needs to know this. He needs closure. He, Itachi, and the Uchiha deserve justice. I won't abandon them. Not now. Kakashi would think about it. Her dedication to her friends was admirable, and maybe he was just growing soft. Perhaps it had to do with what Obito had said. He had no clue why, but the moment that she said she wouldn't abandon them, it resonated with Kakashi's own personal Nindo. And so he decided to help her by telling her of a single location where she should be able to find mission reports and various other documents based around what happened that day. He would point out an abandoned facility and tell her to try there as well. So one night, after putting the children to bed, she snuck out of the house and began to make her way there. The facility was in the mountains, outside the village. Kakashi had advised her to be careful just in case there were traps. She needed to pay attention to tripwires, pressure plates, proximity-activated paper bombs, and various other traps. She was making her way through and at the time wondering why she couldn't have been born half Hyuga. She could really benefit from that right now. As she drew closer, she was astounded to find that this facility wasn't actually abandoned. In fact, there were Anbu there. No, they didn't possess any tattoo on their shoulder. These weren't Anbu, these were Root. She considered turning around and leaving, but suddenly she was gripped by two shinobi around her arms. They dragged her down the mountainside towards the facility where they brought her in. There, they would find the masked members of Root slowly combing the facility. They would take her to Donzo, who would look down on her, his eyes squinted to the point that it looked closed. She sat there for a while, looking up at him before he finally broke the silence. What is the red-hot habanero of the leaf doing this far from the village? She would smirk. Just a leisurely nature scroll. Donzo would take her kunai holster. A leisurely nature scroll, in full armor with weapons. She would shrug. It's dangerous these days. Never know when you're going to run into a genocidal maniac. Donzo would smile at this. So that's what you're after. Information on the Uchiha clan downfall. Why do you need that? It's already known what happened. Itachi Uchiha, having been offered a better deal by another village or party, decided to kill the Uchiha to weaken Konoha. She shook her head and spoke through her teeth, spitting each syllable. I know what you did. Donzo's smile faded as he listened to her continue. I know you killed the Uchiha. I know you ordered Itachi to do it. Hiruzen confirmed that much. Donzo would roll his head on his neck. That old fool can't keep his mouth shut. That's why someone like me needs to exist, and why someone like him shouldn't be Hokage anymore. Kushina, in her anger, asked why the women and children had to die in the attack, and Donzo would then tell her that he needed to be sure that not a single Uchiha remained. So long as they stuck around, Konoha would never know peace. He would command the men to raise her to her feet. Still, he would say, I can't let you leave here with the information you seek. Kushina would growl. You plan to kill me then? Donza would laugh. Heavens, no. If you were able to find this place, then someone must have told you where it was. If we kill you now, your partner will simply expose your business and thusly expose us as your murderers. I had something else in mind. He would hold out his hand and receive from one of his underlings a dossier on the Uchiha clan downfall. He would hold it in his hands and look to Kushina. This is the only copy of the event. Everything in here is the raw, unredacted form. With this single folder, you could ruin the entire village's trust in its leadership. Suddenly, he lit it with fire-style chakra and dropped the dossier on the floor and let it burn to ashes. Kushina would watch as it burned, seeing her only hope of getting justice for the Uchiha go up in smoke. They would then take her out of the facility and let her go. Kushina would make a long trek home where she'd collapse on her bed without even changing out of her gear. She would look up to the ceiling. Minato. What am I supposed to do now? She would wait, as if ready to receive an answer, but when none came, she would turn over in the bed, take up the pillow that used to belong to her husband, and pull it into her embrace, burying her face into it before falling asleep. The day after, she would get up and make breakfast for Naruto and Sasuke before sending them off to the academy. While they were gone, she would go about her day normally, buying groceries, cleaning the home, all while thinking deeply on the lost cause that was the Uchiha massacre case. Working with fervor, she finished the daily chores, and with that out of the way, decided to treat herself to a bowl of Ichiraku ramen. Leaving her home, she would make her way to the tiny shop out in the middle of the village. It had been a favorite spot of Minato and hers, and had blossomed into a perfect date spot and break restaurant for the shinobi both on and off duty. She would go in and order about four bowls. She still held the record. 
Every time she ate the narutomaki in the middle of the soup, she couldn't help but think of her family and any possible universe in which they were all still together. As she silently ate her bowl, another figure would walk in and sit down next to her, ordering one bowl of whatever she was having. The masked figure would look at her, his silver hair standing at a strange angle. Did you find what you were looking for? Kushina would look to Kakashi. No, the abandoned facility wasn't as abandoned as we thought. Donzo burned the Uchiha downfall dossier right in front of me. The only written record of those true events. Gone. Kakashi would scoff. So? Kushina would look at him out of the corner of her eye and gesture with her shoulders. What am I supposed to do then? The evidence is gone. Kakashi would lay his head back on his shoulders and sigh. You were the Hokage's wife. You should know the answer to this. What is it? She asked. Kakashi would look to her. There are always two sets of documents whenever the Anbu perform a mission, especially if it was high profile like this one. Hiruzen heard about it and began shutting down Root. You think he isn't going to have a file on it to base his decision on? Donzo is bluffing, trying to make you take your eye off the ball. This evidence you want still exists, you just gotta find it. Kushina was floored by this new information. Damn, I should have known that. She would put some money on the table, paying for hers and Kakashi's meal before storming off out of the shop. Thanking Kakashi as she raced out with speed even the yellow flash of the leaf would blush at. Returning home, she would wait until Naruto and Sasuke fell asleep before making her way out. Her next stop was the Hokage's residence. As night fell, she waited into the deepest part of the night, when she knew Hiruzen would be asleep. She would sneak in through a window, and there sat the scroll of seals, right out in the open. Kushina would scoff at how loose security was. Why, any down-on-their-luck academy student could just waltz in here under orders of a shifty chunin and take it. If this was any indication of how easy it would be, she shouldn't have any issue taking the dossier. She began by looking in the Hokage's office, careful of any traps. Doubtless, nothing could be this easy. She would notice in the drawer as she planned to open it a magnetic alarm device, designed to activate the alarm the moment the metal plate on the drawer were moved away from the magnet. She would pull a knife from her belt and wedge it into the drawer to keep the magnet from activating the alarm. She would then search the drawer but would find nothing pertaining to the Uchiha. She would then check the other drawers, also finding nothing whatsoever. But Kakashi was adamant that it would be here, so where would it have been? She then decided to check the records room. She would sneak through. This is where it got a little rough. There were armed guards walking through the halls, and she needed to avoid them to get to the records room. Sneaking her way through, she would see two guards coming from either direction, leaving her nowhere to go. Instinctively, she jumped and wedged herself between the two walls just below the ceiling. She looked down, struggling to keep herself up, realizing that her lack of training had indeed left her weaker than she'd like to admit. A bead of sweat rolled down her nose, and she silently prayed that it didn't fall as she watched it. The guards stopped underneath her, and to her horror, they began to talk about their day, the news, and one particularly about his new girlfriend who he just found out was pregnant with their first child. Normally, she'd be happy to hear this, but this was not the right situation for her to congratulate them. She needed to find a way out. She began looking around. Suddenly, that bead of sweat dropped from her nose. As the shinobi talked below, the drop of sweat landed down atop his shaved head. He would wipe it off with his hand and look up but see nothing there. Must have a leak. He hadn't noticed the vent's face closing. She made her way through the vent, which she felt was a better way to navigate as it was unpatrolled and led everywhere. She would need to remember this the next time she had to infiltrate somewhere, which she hoped might be never. Making her way into the records room, she quickly began looking through the records for anything pertaining to the Uchiha. She would find a file. Opening it up, she would find a full report on Root's actions and the massacre. Beyond the contents of the dossier, she also had the report on the investigation, as well as Konoha's attempts to cover it up. Hearing footsteps approaching, she would close the file cabinet, perhaps a little too loudly, and jump back up into the vents. The doors would open as a guard looked around. Satisfied that nothing was wrong, the guard would leave. Kushina would then make her escape and make her way back home with the file in her hands. Entering her abode with a pep in her step, she would turn on the lights only to find her home ransacked. Her heart almost stopped. Without a thought, she turned and ran to the back, basically kicking the door in. Please still be there. Please still be there. She peered into the children's room where she'd find an empty bed, the sheets all messed up and half on the floor. She grunted in worry and frustration as she would catch a glimpse of a masked man outside the window. She would basically jump out after him, kunai in hand. The man would jump up on the wall. I have a message for you from Donzo. If you ever want to see the children again, bring the dossier to the Will of Fire Monument, or there'll be two fresh bodies in the waterways by sunrise. The man would disappear. Kushina, in her rage, would kick a bucket so hard that it would smash into a thousand pieces, tearing into the wall and ripping off part of the stone. She would look at the dossier. Sasuke can't use justice if he's dead. 
she would sigh and begin to make her way to the discussed location. There, she would find Danzo flanked by two guards, as well as a single root shinobi holding both a struggling Sasuke and a crying Naruto. She reassured them, It's okay, Mama's here. Danzo would step forward. Yes, no worries, Mama is here, and so should be the dossier if she has even half the brain the fourth had. Kushina held up the file and threw it to the ground in front of him. He would pick it up and put it into his robe. He would turn around to leave, raising a hand into the air. Kill them. Kushina would raise her hands and throw six shuriken at the shinobi holding Naruto and Sasuke, taking them out. She ran toward them and they towards her. One of the guards threw their own shuriken at the group. Kushina saw it coming and it was as if the world were moving in slow motion. She cried out for them as their hands raised up to take hers. Suddenly those shuriken were knocked out of the air by a flurry of kunai. Kushina took the children into her embrace and covered them with her body while looking around. Standing in the distance was a single man with glowing red eyes and a black coat bearing crimson cloud patterns on it. She would exclaim in shock, Itachi! He would jump down. More root shinobi came out of the woodwork to attack Itachi, giving Kushina time to get Sasuke and Naruto to safety. She would tell them to wait nearby for her but to take cover. Naruto and Sasuke would nod and wait. She would turn and rush back out to help Itachi. There she'd be stopped by Danzo. You could have left this alone, Kushina. None of you would have had to die. Kushina would angrily call out to him that Makoto and the other women and children of the Uchiha didn't have to die either. Danzo would reply that they were a danger to the village, as is she, Naruto, Sasuke, and now Itachi. They all must perish. Kushina, utterly enraged by this man's lack of morality to the point of threatening and killing children, unleashes a power deep within her. Her hair stands up and begins to flow like a thousand snakes as thick whisker-like lines form on her cheeks. Her pupils take on the slits of a fox's eyes as her fingernails become more like claws. She rushes at Donzo, but Donzo is ready with his wind-style chakra blade. He cuts her to ribbons, but the Ninetales chakra begins to regenerate her wounds. Donzo removes the wrappings from his arm and displays an arm embedded with Sharingan. He would begin to use them one by one to survive fatal wounds, something Itachi notices as he joins the fight. He would see Kushina struggling and would work on his last resort. He would flip over Donzo, kicking his leg out from under him before stabbing him in the heart. Donzo would simply disappear and reappear somewhere else and continue his assault. Itachi would turn and continue to fight with him, dishing out attack after attack and taking it before jumping over Donzo, sweeping his legs again and stabbing him in the heart once more. Donzo would disappear and begin attacking again, but by this time it's too late. He's already caught in Itachi's grasp. Itachi explains that Donzo's greatest boon has just become his greatest weakness. As the Izanagi was created to escape fate, Izanami was created to enforce it, and Donzo had just been cast under it, forced to relive the moment forever until he accepts his fate, which he likely never will. So as time on his many Izanagi runs out, he would finish him off as he remains trapped in the Genjutsu. Itachi's eye would go dark as he turns back. He sees Sasuke and stops, ready to leave. Kushina would stop him and bring him over. Sasuke is mixed between sad and angry, his face displaying fear as he steps back, but Kushina reassures him by informing him that bad people made Itachi do bad things. Itachi would embrace his little brother. From this point on, Kushina reveals to the public the truth, and the citizens of Konoha aren't happy about it. And with the wife of the fourth Hokage, they know that her words carry weight. She would not lie about something like this. And even if her words weren't as trustworthy as the people believed, she carried enough proof to sway them. This is a worst case scenario for Hiruzen and the council. All through the day, the people gather at the gates of the Hokage's residence and demonstrate. At night, they riot in the streets, the Anbu being called upon to keep them out. Hiruzen sits in his chair by the window, watching this happen. He realizes the simple fact that perhaps Tobirama chose wrong when he chose him to be third Hokage. He was the only Hokage in history to ever be driven out by the people he served, and he was about to be driven out again. As he sat there and watched, a voice came from behind. I know you didn't mean to. Hiruzen didn't even turn around. Whether I meant to do it or not is irrelevant. I was incapable of protecting those within my village. I have failed them, Kushina. She would then step out of the shadows. She couldn't disagree with Hiruzen, but to a point she respected the man. She respected him like a great uncle. She knew Hiruzen's heart. He wasn't a bad man, nor was he evil. He was just, for lack of a better term, weak. Not physically, but emotionally, spiritually. Kushina had been good friends with Biwako before her death on the day Naruto was born. She had seen how it had affected Hiruzen. He was strong for those nearby, but only she saw it. Hiruzen was just a man. A smart man, but a man whose heart and temperament could not allow him to draw the ire of anyone. 
That mentality sadly was something that wasn't fit for Akage. Sometimes you had to make a tough choice, regardless of how it made you feel. Hiruzen just couldn't do that. His sorrow from the Shinobi World War, the bloodshed, seeing the faces of those who knew that their mother or father or wife or husband or sibling would never be coming home broke him. He had to push the armistice to end the war. He was too busy focusing on stopping the loss of life that he did not recognize that he had invalidated the sacrifices of all those who died on the field of battle, and that led to his first downfall. Then, after he resumed the position after the death of Minato, it was his inability to stand against Danzo that caused the Uchiha to perish. His failure to put down Orochimaru when he had the chance was what led to the formation of Otogakure, a fringe terrorist state that had only existed because Hiruzen was weak. The fact Orochimaru's experimentation had gotten so far was another mistake of Hiruzen's who had failed to stop it when he realized just how many people were dying. Hiruzen was not a bad man, he was just a bad leader. That Kushina could accept. Despite everything, despite the failures and screw-ups on a massive scale that he was guilty of, the complete and utter negligence on his part as Kage, she still respected the man and cared for him. But as it stood, it was time for him to step down. Your time has come. You know that, right? She asked him gently from across the table. He would nod. The time has come and long gone. It should be Minato running this village right now. Perhaps if I had been stronger, he still would be here. She shook her head. Don't blame yourself for that, Hiruzen. That one wasn't you. It was never you. He looked down. I'm not so sure. He turned around to face her. He took his kasa that bore the kanji for fire off and set it on his table. It's time for us to leave this to the next generation. Just as Lord Hashirama and Lord Tobirama left the future to me, I must pass it forward for the good of the village. If the only thing I've ever done as Hokage is making the decision to stop being Hokage, then I'll accept that. She had a bit of a sorrowful look on her face as he said that. Hiruzen would then stand and leave the office. Passing into the darkness, he left behind the role of Hokage for good. The day after, news was spreading across the village that Hiruzen had stepped down from his position as Hokage. He and the other elders had also retired from their positions of leadership and counsel for fear of revolt. The people were pleased. Some continued to seek justice, but the head of the Anbu and the senior Jonin would take control of the village until such a time as a new leader could be decided. Kushina, the crowds cried out. Kushina will lead us. She had mused upon her childhood, her dreams of becoming Hokage, the first woman Hokage in the history of the village hidden in the leaves. But by this time, her interest in the position had waned considerably. She had seen the work Akage must do, and she didn't know if she could handle that right now. Not now that she was a mother raising two children on her own. But the crowd called out for her all the more. Kakashi, one of the trusted members of the Anbu who was helping run the village, would come to Kashina at Ichiraku, as was their usual meeting spot. There, he would talk to her. What you did was incredible. You single-handedly turned the whole village on its head. It is to be as expected from the wife of Lord Fourth, though. Kushina, between slips of noodles, would deny this, stating that she could have done nothing without Kakashi and his guidance. Kakashi would remain modest, telling her that he merely provided her with the information she should already know. As time continued, Kakashi would turn to her. You should consider becoming Hokage, he would tell her. She would look at him out of the corner of her eye with a half-sarcastic smirk. You know I can't do that. I'm raising two children now. I don't have time to balance. Kakashi would nod and continue. The village is going through upheaval. Everything is changing. With the genocide of the Uchiha as well as the Hyuga affair, the greatest clans of the Leaf are faltering, and even some of the other clans are whispering worries that Konoha can no longer protect them, or worse, could be a threat to them. The Nara clan and the Yamanaka clan are two of our strongest outside of the Uchiha and Hyuga, and they're considering splitting off. The people are scared of what the future will bring. What they need right now is something from the past, something they can trust. What they need right now, for better or worse, is a mother's touch. She thinks about this carefully. Kakashi then states that the position will come with people who can watch her children when she can't, and that does sweeten the deal quite a bit. After all, Mama needs some alone time. So she decides that she would like to accept the nomination by the people of Konoha and begins the process. She would meet with the fire daimyo about accepting the position where he and his advisors would go over her track record, her background, achievements, and anything that could stand out as troublesome for her. Thankfully, she is cleared and the daimyo gives the okay. Kushina then returns to Konoha where she takes the position officially and is ceremoniously inaugurated as the fifth Hokage of the Hidden Leaf Village. The first thing she does is surround herself with an administration she knows she can trust. 
The first person on the list is Kakashi Harake, who is honored to take this position on her council. Unofficially, she keeps Hiruzen around. Despite the fact that he was incapable of making world-altering decisions, his input on the day-to-day -day monotony of the job, decorum, and a few other attributes where she could admit he excelled as a kage. He wasn't given an official position and was more treated as a friend of the family. However, she was sure to delegate resources in such a way that he was paid as if he were a full member of staff. She still cared about Hiruzen and knew that with the death of Buiko, he had nothing else in his life. She wanted to at least give him purpose and make him feel like he was aiding Konoha in a capacity that fit his mentality, and he did. In fact, this turn of events made Hiruzen truly happy. He was at first a little iffy about it, not thinking himself worthy of holding even an unofficial position within the government of the village. But with some convincing, he agreed and found it to be even more fulfilling than being a Kage. Along with this, his great knowledge of jutsu was indispensable and was often used to help train Naruto and Sasuke as they grew, forming them into true elite members of the academy whose sheer ability and potential surpassed even Itachi's at that age. However, not everything was so happy and cheerful. After the Hyuga affair, the downfall of the Uchiha, and the revolt that ended Hiruzen's rule, tensions began to rise within all of the great clans of Konoha. The Hyuga were ever steadfast with the village, though the affair indeed left some scars. The Nara and Yamanaka clans were beginning to show disdain for the village, which meant several visits were required by Kushina to ensure them that everything was safe. In her conversations with the clan heads, she did her best to remain respectful towards the clan head, and to remain respectful when speaking of Hiruzen, knowing that the Sarutobi clans were very close to the clans as symbolized by the earrings worn by each generational member of the Ino Shikacho trio. She still managed to distant current Konoha from the former Konoha, all while somehow also managing to make it seem like it was the same. Her goal was to put them at ease and show them that she would do her best to become the new Minato. The Yamanaka clan would be the first to trust her due to the various mind techniques which allowed them to see into her mind, find her intentions, and realize what was or wasn't the truth. The Nara clan was a little less forthcoming, though they softened up a little after witnessing the Yamanaka clan so willingly join up with her. They would agree to remain within the village as well, but only if she agreed to learn how to play Shogi from Shikaku Nara, head of the clan. For Kushina, this was a very odd request, but she went along with it. For a time, they began to go over the pieces, their function, how they're generally placed, the limitations of each piece, and the strengths they can bring each other. Once Kushina learns this, as well as the starting positions, Shikaku begins going over various strategies and maneuvers. But he reminds her that no matter the strategy you choose, you must always ensure that the king is protected. And to do so, sometimes you must make moves that appear to take you in the wrong direction some moves that sacrifice other pieces. No matter what happens, you must protect your king. You can promote pieces, capture others, and turn them to your side, but all these pieces will only ever serve two main roles, to protect their king and capture the other king. Kushina listens to him speak. Then, Shikaku suddenly seems to change the subject and asks what Kushina thinks about the village, about Hiruzen, and most importantly, about the decision to eradicate the Uchiha. Kushina states that she loves her village and has many times sacrificed for it and is willing to continue sacrificing for it. Shikaku is pleased with this answer and prods her onto Hiruzen. She states that Hiruzen was a great man, but that he was misguided and particularly weak when it came to certain decisions, and the destruction of the Uchiha was detestable. Shikaku would nod in understanding. He'd continue to speak. Hiruzen was a great man, but he was terrible at shogi. Regardless, his determination to keep Konoha going was what drove me to respect him. Kushina listens as Shikaku begins to elaborate. Look down before you, Kushina. What do you see? She would look down. A shogi board. He would smile. I see the shinobi world. Kushina was confused for a moment. Shikaku began to explain. You're king. Do you know what that is? Kushina would shrug. It's definitely not me. Shikaku would nod. You're damn right it's not. And if you had claimed it to be you, I would have resigned the Nara clan from being a part of Konoha right then and there. But you are showing a humble capacity to learn, and so I shall explain. He lifted the king up. This piece represents Konoha as a whole. And the many clans and organizations within Konoha are these. The pawns, lances, knights, bishop. These each are the clans and other shinobi. Each one has strengths and weaknesses, but each one is balanced by the other, and their sole purpose is to protect the king and capture the enemy. Those two concepts are not mutually exclusive either. Sometimes strength and warfare are used to protect one's nation by defeating the other that threatens it. Men of peace prepare for war. The balance between concepts remains. Hiruzen and I never once played a game of shogi together, not with this board anyway. 
he and I played shogi with the other shinobi villages. That game was called the Great Ninja War. That was how I know that he was not a fantastic shogi player because I saw the many unnecessary moves he made. The most detestable of all was forfeiting the game when we were going to win, but at the same time, I respect that decision. Do you know why? Kushina was speechless and merely shrugged. Shikaku continued, because Hiruzen was attempting to protect the king. The king cannot be taken if the game is over. In that way, I also praised his response to the Hyuga affair. He was willing to sacrifice someone to maintain peace. Now, don't get me wrong, there are a lot of things at stake in situations like this, which is why wars and politics have infinitely more dimensions than Shogi, but the basic premise is the same. He knew our power, and better still, the other nations knew our power. When war was threatened, he had nothing to gain by fighting, especially after we had just signed the armistice with Iwa. The peace we had was paid for in blood. He hoped to keep it, and in doing so, he sacrificed a pawn to protect the king. A pawn that could not be used further against the king should the game continue. He showed what many considered disloyalty to the Hyuga, but his sacrificing of Hizashi was what stopped so many others from dying in a meaningless conflict, and the Hyuga knew that. But let me ask you this. Let's say that a piece on the board is taken and reintroduced to the game as your enemy's piece. What do you do then? Kushina thought for a moment. You remove it from the game. Shikaku would nod. This piece that I took and am now using against you, they're the Uchiha. She almost flipped the game board right then and there. She stood. How can you say this? Are you saying that what happened to the Uchiha was the right thing to do? Shikaku sat there and waited for her to calm before speaking. Not exactly. There were other, better ways to handle it. We could have easily recaptured the piece, and that's something that's troubled my clan ever since the event transpired. But at the same time, removing them from the game was not altogether off the table. The Uchiha were planning an uprising. Danzo's actions were the actions of a man protecting the king. You should know that the age we live in is one of deterrence. One sword keeps another in its sheath. The Uchiha were strong, but they did not make up the entirety of Konoha's power. If they had succeeded in their coup, it would have weakened the village to a point of a complete loss of balance on all boards, and would have spiraled into war. What happened to the Uchiha should have been the last resort, but at the same time, never forget that it was still something we could have easily resorted to. I'm upset because a piece was wasted and worry that our clan could be easily wasted as well. Not that I hold a grudge for the disposal of a treasonous clan. Kushina's blood was boiling, but she was maintaining herself for many reasons. The first was because she didn't want to destroy any hope of bringing the Nara clan back into the fold but the second was because Shikaku was making a lot of sense, and she hated it. Shikaku would sit. What I'm trying to do here, Lord Fifth, is teach you, remind you of the responsibility before you. If any clan ever becomes a threat to you, balance the choice as well, weigh the risks and rewards, but never hesitate to sacrifice a piece to protect the king, especially if there is no choice. It's equally possible that the Uchiha could have resisted all attempts to bring them back into the fold. Then they should have been destroyed but not until it was confirmed where the pieces on the board lie. What other moves can be made? I want you to play this international game of shogi with your head, not your heart. She sat there and thought more about it. She nodded. It was then that Shikaku claimed the clan would continue with Konoha, so long as she kept true to his words. And to prove that she would do so, she invited not only him, but Inoichi Yamanaka, Choza Akamichi, and Hiyashi Hyuga to all be a part of her council, to which their words would help her make proper choices. If the village was the king, then all pawns, including herself, needed to be together to properly communicate and devise their next moves. It's around this time that Itachi Uchiha returns to the village. Having been pardoned, and having had his cover within the Akatsuki blown, the only thing he could do was return to Konoha. Along with him comes intel on its members as well as their goal of collecting all the tailed beasts, including the one inside of Kushina. Kushina takes this knowledge to heart. The defenses of the village are increased, and a bolo for any Akatsuki members is put out by Kushina to all shinobi in the village. A goodwill message would later be sent out to the other great shinobi nations to inform them of the threat of the terrorist group that seeks to take the tailed beasts. Itachi's return to the village is not without controversy, as Itachi was the one to carry out this order, even if he was coerced into doing so. Some see him as a heroic person who sacrificed everything for the village. Others see him as a homicidal maniac who murdered his entire family. Caught in the middle is Sasuke, who despite realizing what had happened, still remains caught in a love-hate relationship with Itachi. To aid in the rebuilding of their nation and the acknowledgement of their feelings, Kushina assigns Itachi to become the leader of Team 7 and then places Sasuke on it, alongside her son, Naruto, and Sakura Harano. This starts out rocky, as Itachi has never been the leading type. 
He's been on teams before, yeah, but never as the leader. He does his best, but Sasuke remains distant. His conflicted feelings come from how much he idolized Itachi, yet he watched him kill their parents. Sasuke by this time understands why Itachi did it, but a part of him can't get over it. There are some scars that are just too sensitive to be touched. This leads to Sasuke becoming more and more distant from Itachi. Kushina even attempts to mend the bridge by allowing Sasuke to stay at Itachi's apartment, but in the night she finds him back in the Hokage's residence, trying to sleep in his own room. Some nights he just stays awake, twiddling his thumbs, or masterfully solving a puzzle cube with the photographic nature of his Sharingan. She would walk in and sit down beside him and ask what's wrong. He would shrug it off. She would ask why he's not happy to see his big brother again. He wouldn't answer her, he would just continue to solve the cube over and over again with ever-increasing speed. Realizing that it'll take a lot more than just quality time to defrost their relationship, she decides to give them the extra special mission to the Land of Waves. She hopes that by sending Sasuke there with Itachi and Naruto that it might offer some normalcy. After all, throwing Naruto in there as a happy medium between the two should help Sasuke feel more at home while attempting to mend his tattered relationship with Itachi. While they're on the mission, Sasuke mostly keeps to himself, and Itachi tends not to talk directly to him out of respect for his little brother's personal space. Still, Sasuke shows incredible strength and fortitude when facing off against the Demon Brothers, and when Zabuza attacks, Itachi's sheer strength as well as the abilities of his Mangekyo Sharingan are plenty to give him the complete edge, allowing them to complete their mission, the building of the bridge being completed soon after, named the Bridge of the Storm God. Kushina, meanwhile, is hard at work readying for the other village leaders for the upcoming Chunin exams. She was signing off on proctors and planned tests. All the while, Hiruzen was there trying to help her figure out which tests were best. As this went down though, she suddenly receives a visit from Jiraiya, who she welcomes with a hug. Together, they go about planning the exams. It's then that Jiraiya asks if she's going to let Naruto take the exam. Kushina states that it's not her place to decide whether he should or shouldn't, and that it's Itachi who gets to decide. She mentions though that when Team 7 returns from the Land of Waves, that she will recommend allowing Team 7 to take the exams. Regardless of if they're allowed to join or not, Kushina states that she wants Jiraiya to train Naruto. When the old sage asks why, she mentions that it would do Naruto some good to train under his father's mentor and learn the same techniques that Minato did, as a way for her to allow Naruto to grow closer to the father he never knew. However, she did have a secondary objective. She wants to pull Naruto away for a while and force Sasuke into training with Itachi, hoping that if she really forces it, they just might reconcile. Hiruzen would then mention Sakura, asking how Kushina plans to deal with her, as she would then have nowhere to go if she's forcing Sasuke and Itachi into some alone time. Kushina mentions that she will take her under her wing personally, teaching her some techniques that will make any girl into a weapon to rival the greatest warriors in the Shinobi world. Team 7 would return, and Kushina would prod Itachi to see if he thinks it's feasible to allow Team 7 to take the exams. Itachi says they could, and so they're allowed to join. Kushina, like many other heads of the village, is paying attention to the test, but isn't seeing what's happening outside of it. A new game of Shogi has started, and the king is is in check. As the test continues and the second stage begins, Kushina is informed that a set of three bodies have been found. She goes to check it out and finds a group of shinobi from the hidden grass. What she finds so peculiar about this group is that they no longer possess faces. Hiruzen identifies the jutsu and informs Kushina, who would immediately send shinobi into the forest of death to find whoever are impersonating the kusanin. They don't find anything, but they do find the unconscious Sasuke laying by Naruto and Sakura. Naruto and Sakura both agree that they need to get Sasuke help and so they forfeit the match. They bring Sasuke back and he's admitted to the hospital. Kushina is the first to rush in and see him. Itachi comes as soon as he can. The doctors inform them that Sasuke has been affected by a cursed mark placed on the base of his neck. Hiruzen recognizes it and calls for Anko and reveals that she also has the same pattern. The curse mark of heaven. Hiruzen informs her that the jutsu he has witnessed leads him to believe that Orochimaru is in the village and that he's up to no good. Hiruzen would mention that Sasuke bearing the curse mark would mean that Orochimaru is hoping to take his body. Itachi confirms that this is likely the case. He informs both Hiruzen and Kushina that Orochimaru had been within the Akatsuki for a time, but had left the organization without honor and only one of his hands after trying to take Itachi's body over the Sharingan, which now only he had. He mentions how he fought Orochimaru off and that now he may be going after Sasuke, as he is the only Uchiha left with a natural Sharingan to Itachi's knowledge. Well, besides the masked man that he believed to be Madara, or someone using that name as a guise. Hiruzen tells them that they need to be very careful, and so for a time, they
they put Sasuke under surveillance to protect him. Itachi eventually decides to use his little brother's visage as bait, but using the transformation jutsu to become an exact replica of him. The Chunin exams continue on without a hitch, and eventually a month comes for training. By this time, Naruto has already left with Jiraiya to do some training of his own. At the moment, Naruto is learning Rasengan and Sage Mode. Sasuke, though, has had the evil sealing jutsu placed on him and is recovering far from the sight of anyone but those trusted within Konoha. As time passes, Itachi would return to Sasuke to check up on him, but Sasuke seems as distant as ever. Itachi feels unworthy to actually interact with him, but Kushina is tired of watching this, so she basically commands Itachi to go in and talk to Sasuke. Itachi obliges and goes in to speak with his brother. For a time, they sit in silence, with Itachi breaking it with small talk only to receive the cold shoulder. Itachi would try to work through it and speak of something else, something maybe they had in common. Itachi, despite everything, is actually beginning to feel affected by this. He thought he was willing to take on any burden, any pain to keep Sasuke safe. But now that he no longer needed to play the villain anymore, Sasuke still hated him, and that stung a lot more than he could admit. In an effort to connect, he asks Sasuke for a sign, anything that proves he still loves him no matter how small. But Sasuke doesn't speak, merely keeping his back turned. Itachi would wait a moment, and upon receiving no answer, he would nod and say that he probably deserves it anyway before standing up to leave. But before he leaves the room, a voice speaks. Why did you kill them? Itachi would stop and look back. What was that? Itachi would wait a moment before another response. Why did you kill mom and dad? Itachi closed his eyes as he thought back. It was my orders. Sasuke didn't seem to take that as an answer. But why did you decide to follow them? Itachi would come back into the room and slowly sit down. It was to protect you. Sasuke's head raised, but remained facing away from Itachi. Protect me. Itachi would continue. Donzo threatened your life, saying that we could all die together or that I could save your life by killing them myself. Sasuke would sit for a moment longer. We could have just run away, he said, with the slightest bit of emotion in his voice. Itachi shook his head. That wouldn't have been feasible. The Anbu would have found us. That was if I could even get father to leave the village with us all. Sasuke remained silent as Itachi continued. It was the only thing I could think to do. I had to save your life. If I hadn't chosen to kill the Uchiha, you would have died. I did it for you. Sasuke shook his head. I needed you, he said, his emotions boiling to the top revealing without looking that he had lost his composure, that he was crying. If you wanted to save me, then why did you abandon me? Why did you insult me, torture me, and then leave me if you loved me so much? Itachi's heart was struck by that. Sasuke, I always loved you. I left you here because I wanted you to be safe. Where I was going, what I was doing, you didn't need to be exposed to that. Sasuke snapped. I didn't need to be exposed to my parents' death. Itachi was silent. Sasuke didn't respond either. A silence fell upon the room for about 60 seconds. Itachi broke that silence. I wanted you to hate me. I wanted you to grow stronger, to find me, to make me pay for what I had done and return to Konoha as a hero. Sasuke would sniffle a little. I didn't need to be a hero. I needed my brother. I was alone and needed my brother, but you left me, called me weak, said that I wasn't worth killing. You forced me to witness the death of my parents through your genjutsu. If you had explained it to me, I would have listened. I might not have understood, but I would have trusted you. I worshipped you, Itachi. You were everything I wanted to be. I would have stuck with you. We could have left the village together and stayed together, but you abandoned me. You killed to save me and then you abandoned me. Itachi would shake his head and kneel beside Sasuke's bed. I didn't want to abandon you, Sasuke. I wanted you to be safe. Sasuke looked back at him. I don't care. I lost my parents and ended up dumped onto Kushina. If she hadn't taken me in, there's no telling where I would have ended up. I didn't care where I was. I didn't care that you were in a dangerous place. I wanted to be with you. Itachi would sit by the bed and hug Sasuke as he cried into his shoulder. Outside the door, Kushina was listening all along and was fighting tears of her own. This was the pain that Sasuke was carrying with him for so long. The pain of abandonment. Kushina was like a mother to him, but she could never replace his real mother. And Naruto would never replace Itachi. She had known that all along, too. She then collected herself and moved on to let the two brothers have their moment. She wiped tears from her eyes and smiled, knowing that this was the first step to them reconciling. As the month came to an end, the Chunin exams began again, but there was no sign of Orochimaru. Speaking with Hirazin, she would ask why Orochimaru would come back besides for Sasuke, and Hirazin would tell her that he was here to kill him and challenge the might of Konoha. Kushina, hearing this, would command Kakashi to remain with Hirazin, to which he agreed. As the semifinals began, it was down to Neji and Gara, but in the middle of the fight, Gara put himself to sleep and awakens Shukaku. Shukaku begins to devastate the arena. At that point, a smoke bomb goes off in the Kage's viewing box. 
Kushina would end up trying to stop Gara while Orochimaru and Hiruzen fought. Kushina would enter the arena as the One Tail would begin to focus attacks on her, recognizing her as the host of Kurama. She would attempt to capture the beast with her adamantine chains, but this fails as Shukaku breaks through them. The people are scrambling to get out of the stadium as members of the Anbu rush out of the woodwork to aid her. Speaking of woodwork, guess who shows up? Yamato. Yamato is currently the only member of Konoha's military to be capable of using wood release, the same techniques that Hashirama Senju used to create each of the tailed beasts. However, his usage of it is limited, as he doesn't have the chakra reserves required to utilize the full extent of it. However, with Kushina there, they could do it. Utilizing Hokage-style 60-year-old technique entering society with bliss-bringing hands while she uses her adamantine chains. Doing these two together has the combined effect which would force Shukaku back into Gara and leave him unconscious. Elsewhere, Hiruzen is fighting Orochimaru, but after a time, the Reaper Death Seal is used. Regardless of if anyone interacts to help at this point, Hiruzen would die. However, as he spends over an hour attempting to seal Orochimaru, during that time, Kushina would show up and see Hiruzen in there attempting to do so. She would curse as she can't get through the barrier, but Kakashi would manage to get her through using his Kamui. Once she was inside, she could give Hiruzen some of her chakra, which would result in Hiruzen being capable of sealing Orochimaru away completely before he himself is as well. Kushina laments the death of Hiruzen. She had not only been robbed of an advisor, but of a friend. However, with the threat of Orochimaru out of the way, they must now focus on the Akatsuki. Kushina knows that this plot, while devised by Orochimaru, was likely a plot by the Akatsuki to get rid of her and steal the Nine Tails, something Itachi confirms as likely being the case. So, Kushina asks Jiraiya to join her council, but he says that it's not really his style, and instead recommends Tsunade. Sending for her, she would recruit Tsunade into the council. Now, Konoha has captured Gara, but they can't keep him. After all, the Kazakage was murdered on his way to the exams, and for fear of a war breaking out, the San siblings are sent home to Sunagakure. From here, a three-year time skip occurs in which Konoha begins to prepare for war. The sound of the rain pitter-pattering off the dry ground filled the air as the sound of thunder roared over the trees above. Again, Kushina demanded. Standing before her was the pink-haired Kunoichi who had basically become a daughter to her. Sakura stood there, drenched in sweat and the deluge of water falling from the sky. Her hands were together as she tried again. Kushina looked her over and began to wonder if she had enough chakra for this. You've been studying with Lady Tsunade, have you not? The mark on Sakura's forehead told her everything she needed to know. Kushina nodded. That mark is the strength of a hundred seal. It is the personal jutsu of Lady Tsunade and increases your chakra reserves incredibly. Because of that, you should have no issue learning this technique. So prove to me and Lady Tsunade that all those months we spent training you didn't go to waste. Kushina was a kind woman, but a brutal taskmaster. She was called the Red Hot Habanero of the Leaf for a reason, and Sakura was seeing that side of her now. Sakura would let out a cry of exhaustion as she strained harder. Suddenly, from her back shot chains. Kushina, a little too giddy, clapped, her gaping smile taking over much of her face as her eyes went wide with joy. You got it! You got it! The adamantine chains! Now, a small note. I know many of you will question this and say that Sakura can't learn adamantine chains because she isn't an Uzumaki. Well, technically, that's not true. Adamantine chains have never been identified as a Kekai Genkai to any capacity. The Uzumaki have never been stated to have a Kekai Genkai, with their sealing techniques and incredible life force being what they're known for the most. However, their sealing techniques can be taught to others, just as Minato learned the Reaper Death Seal, as did Hiruzen. The Reaper Death Seal is actually an Uzumaki original, as they were the only clan capable of freeing the souls inside the Shinigami due to their possession of the mask that they kept locked away in their shrine. In a similar manner, adamantine chains are technically not considered a Kekai Genkai, and instead are known as a secret technique. Given that they're a secret technique, it should stand to reason that anybody might be capable of using them. The only reason why I could think that Sakura wouldn't be able to was because of her chakra reserves. However, with the strength of a hundred seal, this should be no big feat for her. So, I think that Sakura would be able to make use of the adamantine chains. So, this is my explanation as to why I think it would work. Anyway, back to the story. Kushina claps as Sakura has brought her own adamantine chains to bear. She seems a little confused at first, but upon noticing them, she yells in excitement at having done it. Kushina would hug her and tell her how proud she is of her. After a brief moment more, she and Sakura calm down. She leads the girl back to the Hokage's residence after this training session and passes her a towel. She looks around. There were people bustling about, but there was a sound that was missing. Naruto and Sasuke's voices. 
For a couple of years now, both were gone. They had left the village to train with their respective mentors, Naruto with Jiraiya and Sasuke with Itachi. That left poor Sakura all alone. With her team gone off training, Sakura felt a little useless, and we can't have that. Alternating between training under Lady Tsunade and Kushina herself, Sakura had shown great growth. Not only had her chakra reserves and overall strength increased, but she had developed many critical techniques that made her a true threat to anyone who would stand in her way. Not to mention, it was just nice having another girl to hang around. Kushina had spent most of her life surrounded by boys, with the only girls she could consider friends being Biwako Sarutobi and Makoto Uchiha, both deceased at the moment. So to say that Kushina felt like a teenager again was an understatement. Time spent with Tsunade and Sakura had done her some good. Tsunade was a real party animal when she wasn't working, and boy could she drink Kushina under the table. She felt like she and Tsunade were practically family, and to a point they were. Tsunade was quarter Uzumaki and quarter Senju, both of which were cousins to each other and therefore cousins to Kushina. And while Sakura had hardly any connection to them familially, she could party with the best of them. Of course, they didn't let her drink or gamble for real, but Tsunade was surprised how easily she could hold a bluff, and she easily wiped the house when playing Koi Koi. Tsunade couldn't wait for her to reach legal age. She wanted to see what she could do in a real gambling joint. As much as Kushina enjoyed the moment, she still missed Naruto and Sasuke. However, she could feel better some days, as she wrote them weekly. Their letters would come in as well, and even if they never signed, she could tell who sent what. Naruto looked like he was writing with his left hand and used informal characters and bad grammar at times. Sasuke, on the other hand, actually was writing with his left hand, but that's because his left hand was his dominant hand. His letters always used honorifics, always spoke with respect, and his characters looked like they were straight from a stamp or typewriter. They were always so uniform and straight, all while Naruto's letters had him writing up the sides of the paper when he ran out of room on a line. But regardless of how perfect or imperfect the letters were, she cherished them all and kept them in boxes by her bedside. After drying off for a while, Sakura would declare to her mentors that she was going home, much to their disappointment. But she promised to be back soon for another girl's night. Tsunade let out a woot woot and Kushina giggled and waved goodbye to her protege. She then made her way to the shower to clean off. She actually had a meeting this afternoon. The weather was bad and she wondered if it could be an omen. After considering that she was meeting with the 5th Kazakage, she expected it to be about as bad as it seemed to be. She quickly finished cleaning herself off and began to dry and had many a servant girl helping her with her hair and makeup to ensure her appearance demanded respect. She never really focused on this, but Tsunade told her that it was important to project power in front of an unruly nation like Suna. Getting ready, she put on her best outfit and grabbed her most intimidating weapon and strapped it to her side to show strength as well as grace. Upon readying herself, she made her way into the meeting chamber and sat down, Tsunade standing beside her. It's been a while since I've last seen Gara. Last time he was here, he nearly killed us all. I would have him up and under the jail to this day if his father Rasa had not been murdered on the way there. Tsunade nodded. Indeed. Be certain not to grow agitated in front of him, but also be sure not to take any crap from him either. Kushina nodded. The door then opened and Gara strode in, wearing the standard robes of Akage. He was followed by his siblings, Kankuro and Tamari. Stepping in, they offered the slightest bow, so lightly that one might think they hadn't even bowed at all. Gara then asked if he may sit, and Kushina allowed him to. Kankuro pulled the chair back, and Gara sat down in it, scooting it forward with the aide's help. A wonderful day for a meeting, he said as the sound of thunder echoed across the sky. Kushina nodded. I was a little surprised that you chose not to postpone. Gara shrugged. It does not rain much in Suna. I wanted to experience the rain for myself. She noticed that the tips of Gara's hair seemed wet. For a moment, she remembered that he wasn't much older than Naruto, being about 15. He was still a kid himself. Still, he seemed different than he did in the past. He was not quite as unruly and cruel. He seemed ever so slightly more laid back. What is it you desire of us? She asked him. I first would like to apologize for my part in the attack on Konoha during your previous Chunin exams two years ago. I have no excuse in my actions and would like to instead follow my own path instead of my father's. I would like to forge a closer bond with Konoha. Kushina was surprised by this turn of events, but then again, Konoha Crush was the brainchild of Orochimaru and the fourth Kazakage, the latter of which being betrayed by the former before he could seek the fruition of their plans. Kushina remained silent, not wanting to express cruelty and risk war by refusing the apology, not wanting to seem weak and naive by immediately accepting it. She instead waited for him to continue. I would like to form a pact with you. Her ears perked up. Oh, a pact? Gara continued. A second Chunin exams. A joint exams hosted by both Suna and Konoha. Kushina looked to Tsunade, who looked down at her. They then looked back to Gara, Kushina speaking. Okay, 
But why though? Tamari's brows raised and Konkuro's mouth was left agape. Gara's expression did not change, as he thought that to be an appropriate response. Mutual benefit. After the previous exams, your nation took a hit on the world platform. A small nation like Otogakure not only nearly toppled your nation, but managed to sneak in unopposed. To be frank, the murder of our Kazakage has been met with criticism, but is further blamed on Konoha. By hosting this together, it would not only help boost your reputation among the other villages, but it would also prove to be a sign of solidarity between our two nations, something I think we sorely need. Kushina scratched her chin. I see, but what do you get out of it? So far, everything you've said benefits us. What's the benefit to you? Gara then spoke. Solidarity is one benefit. Our nation is falling on hard times. But I feel you should know the simple truth. I am using you for bait. Tsunade slammed the table. Now wait a damn minute. Gara did not flinch, but Kushina certainly did. She held out her hand. Wait for just a moment, Lady Tsunade. Let's hear what he has to say instead of flat out rejecting him. She turned her eyes to Gara and continued. There's always time to reject him after he's finished. Gara cleared his throat and then continued. You are the Ninetales Jinchuriki. You, like me, are possessed by a demon beast that craves only destruction. In times past, your first Hokage distributed these beasts to each nation for pay in hopes of forming a bond of friendship and balancing world power, leading to peace through deterrence. That peace was ruined by the first Shinobi World War, and now the fragile peace between all five great nations is under threat once more by the Akatsuki. They're attempting to take the tailed beasts, just as you've said. If nothing happens, these tuning exams would be good for our relations and future as independent nations. But if all goes according to plan, we may draw out the Akatsuki and put an end to this threat right here and now. Kushina thought about it. She looked to Tsunade, who almost seemed to be shaking her head, certain that this was still some trap. Kushina still pondered it. She was hesitant, but ultimately she agreed. She stood and shook his hand. Then, is it agreed? He asked. She nodded. It is. But there is one condition. What? Gara asked, his voice as dry as the sands of the village from which he came. We hold the exams here in Konoha again, she said. Gara would wait for a moment before speaking. Are you sure that's wise? This could invite trouble to your nation. Kushina nodded. I can protect my shinobi in my nation. I can hardly protect them in yours. And the old wounds opened two years ago still keep us from fully trusting you. For us to go along with this, all the cards would need to be in our deck. Agreed? Gara would struggle to find words, but eventually would just nod his head. Agreed. He would then turn to leave. I will have my people contact yours. I'll see you soon. He would leave. Tsunade would shake her head. Using you as bait? The gall of that child. Kushina shrugged it off. It's a solid plan. After all, if the Akatsuki are after the tailed beasts, how are they going to be able to pass up two tailed beasts served to them on a silver platter? Tsunade couldn't disagree, so she followed suit. As you wish, Lord Fifth. Once more, Kushina begins attempting to set up the tuning exams. She is once more reminded of the silence within the Hokage's residence, as Hiruzen is no longer there to aid her. She enjoyed hearing his raspy voice give her instructions, tell her jokes, and even laugh when she made one herself. She would not hear that voice again. This struck a chord in her that almost made her cry, but when her silence was caught by Tsunade, she immediately asked what their plans were for ladies' night on Saturday. Tsunade would laugh and say, We're working, that's what. Setting up the tuning exams, she would name Shikamaru the proctor of the first test, Tamari the proctor of the second, which would take place in the Forest of Death, and the third would be held by both sides, and would be the same exhibition matches as they had been two years prior. Unbeknownst to them, as well as the Akatsuki, Fu, the Jinchuriki of Chome, arrived in the village for the exams, though she seemed more interested in making friends. The more Kushina saw of Fu, the more she began to wish that Naruto was here to meet her. Kushina thought Fu was very similar to Naruto. Tsunade would scold Kushina for trying to set up her son with girls, saying that he would choose for himself. But she's perfect, Kushina would shout. Tsunade would scoff through a laugh. She does remind me of him, if not a little less rambunctious. Deep down within Kushina, though, her tailed beast rumbled, knowing that more tailed beasts were nearby. As the test got underway, Kushina had Kakashi keep his eyes peeled for more trouble. Gara had Konkuro doing the same. There were many entrants from different villages, but sadly none of these villages were of the five shinobi villages save Konoha and Suna. 
As the tests went on, though, the shadows came alive, moving with the presence of Hidan and Kakazu. Conan had ordered them to come to the village, as there were going to be two tailed beasts to take. However, it was a pleasant surprise to the Akatsuki to learn that there were three tailed beasts here. They couldn't have been luckier. To that end, they signaled for help to come, and such help was fulfilled by Deidara and Kisame. Deidara had specifically chosen to leave Toby at home, as Toby's eccentric actions and inability to control himself would ultimately lead to their downfall as soon as he saw some mochi or a toad wallet that he wanted. Besides, Kisame's help was a better choice, as his Samehata had the ability to absorb chakra, and that included Tailed Beast Chakra. That way, if they couldn't get all the Tailed Beasts, they could at least get away with something. They reviewed the schedule and realized that the best time for them to strike would be during the second of three exams. In the Forest of Death, they would find tree cover, and very few people would recognize them if seen. They could pick up Fu there, and then when nobody was paying attention, they could nab Kushina and Gara. That was the plan. That was how they would execute it. However, unbeknownst to anyone, Naruto and Jiraiya were returning to the village, and on the way, they'd found Sasuke and Itachi. Returning to the village, both boys would make their way back to Kushina to greet her. Naruto would greet her with a kiss on the cheek, and Sasuke would offer a hug. She would begin to notice that Sasuke was smiling a lot more and seemed a lot happier. She looked to Itachi, who smiled. He nodded to her to tell her that they had indeed made up. She hugged into Sasuke and kissed his cheek. Did my boys get nice and strong? Jiraiya would tell her how he taught Naruto all the skills that she had requested, and Itachi mentioned that he passed a few jutsu onto his baby brother as well. Naruto would look around and ask what was going on, and Kushina would inform them that they were hosting another Chunin exams. Naruto, annoyed, would ask why she didn't invite them. She would smile and say that she didn't want to disturb their training. Naruto was annoyed, but he and Sasuke began to root for Sakura anyway, knowing that if anything, she could become a Chunin out of the deal. During the Forest of Death, however, Fu is captured by the Akatsuki on her way to the tower, and her allies killed. Konoha does not learn of this, however, as nobody would be sent in until it was too late. During transition to the third stage, the Kazakage and Hokage's entourage would be attacked by the Akatsuki. Itachi would engage with them, as would Jiraiya and Kakashi. Kisame would face his old partner and cross his arms. It's been a while, Itachi. The Akatsuki have grown dull without you around. Itachi would glare at his former partner and speak. I won't let you take the Hokage. Kisame pulls Samehara out. It is truly a shame. He pulls his eyelids down and continues. It's such a shame you lost sight of your ideals, Itachi, he shouts, mocking Itachi's dead Sharingan, the one he sacrificed to kill Danzo years earlier. Itachi was not moved by the bad pun. Kisame would shrug. Hey, at least I tried. He would swing his blade at him. While the Akatsuki are facing off against Kakashi, Jiraiya, and Itachi, they don't notice Daedara's clay clone sneaking up behind Gara and Kushina. The clones manage to capture them. Kakashi manages to seal Hidan away in his Kamui dimension for the time being, and Kakazu is killed by Jiraiya. Before the battle can go any further, Kisame pulls out to regroup with Deidara as they make their escape with their three prizes. Itachi would then meet up with Tamari and Konkuro, and a quick team would be put together consisting of them, Naruto, and Sasuke. The five shinobi would set out after the Akatsuki, with Itachi and Sasuke both utilizing their Sharingan to search for any leads to their location. Together, they discover the Akatsuki's location as they begin to pull the tailed beast from their Jinchuriki. Sadly, Fu is the first to have her beast taken and perishes. They then focus on Kushina and begin pulling the tailed beast from her. When the shinobi arrive, they're faced again with Kisame, but to their surprise, he's not alone. Sasori has also appeared to help. It's then that Sasori and Konkuro do battle with each other to test who's the superior puppet master. Tamari attempts to help, but Sasori proves to be too much when he reveals his Kazakage puppet. Hiroko also gives Sasori quite a bit of protection from the attacks of Tamari, and the scorpion tail was enough to strike back at her. With neither capable of gaining purchase over Sasori, Sasuke joins the fray. Itachi wants Sasuke to be careful, as Sasori possesses powerful poison. Itachi and Naruto fight vigorously to defeat Kisame, and upon a double-sided attack, they seem to have killed him. Breaking through, Naruto and Itachi ambush Deidara right as he has pulled out the Ninetales. With a quick strike, it's over. However, Kisame is revealed to not really be dead as he emerges from his blade. He manages to ambush them to rescue Deidara, but it is too late for the explosive master, so he just makes off with his body. Kushina lays on the ground, and Itachi fears the worst. Gara tells them that without her tailed beast, she will die. Outside, they manage to break through Hiroko, and the real Sasori emerges. Even he is revealed to be a puppet, though, and despite all of their attacks, he continues to fight. Utilizing his Sharingan, Sasuke notices that most chakra is flowing through the puppet to an area on its right peck. 
and Konkodo states that even if he converted himself into a puppet, there still must be some part of him that's human. Konkodo hedges his bets that the place on his chest is his heart, and so Sasuke decides that he'll take it out. Utilizing Chidori, a technique Itachi once learned from watching Kakashi before passing it down to Sasuke, he rushes forward. Jumping over the wire coming from Sasori's stomach, he races forward and puts his hand through the chest cavity where Sasori's heart was, killing him. Konkodo and Tamari celebrate, congratulating Sasuke. Konkodo goes in for a high five, but as Sasuke's hand is about to strike Konkodo's, his legs start to go out from under him. What? He looks down to see a little bit of blood, just a hint on his knee. Even if it was ever so slightly, Sasori's wire had cut Sasuke and the deadly poison was getting in. They grabbed Sasuke and dragged him into a cave where they were trying to save Kushina. They lay him down too. Itachi turned to Sasuke and checked on him. He didn't have the antidote, so he did the best he could and created a tourniquet, hoping that it might at least buy them some time. Utilizing the sand in Gara's gourd, they flew both Kushina and Sasuke back to Konoha. Itachi sent his crow ahead with a message, hoping that it might be able to get Tsunade ready. As soon as they get to the Konoha hospital, Kushina and Sasuke are rolled in. The doctors take Sasuke on and Tsunade focuses on Kushina. She does everything she can to save her life, but isn't sure what they can do. Meanwhile, the doctors are trying every antidote in the book to save Sasuke, but nothing's working. It's then that Sakura comes in and takes command. She's startled to see Sasuke in such condition, but Tsunade had taught her that the worst thing you can do when someone is hurt is to be panicking. So she attempts to maintain her composure and gets to work. Extracting some of the poison, she manages to craft an antidote that would deal with the poison. She administers it to him and stays by his side until he awakens. Time passes, and amazingly, Kushina makes a recovery. Naruto thanks Tsunade, but Tsunade says that she didn't do anything. They question Kushina about this, and Kushina explains. She says that when the masked man came and removed the nine tails from her the first time, she learned from it. And when Itachi told her that the Akatsuki were hunting tailed beasts, she took it to heart. That night, she split the nine tails into two halves, a yin half and a yang half. She states that the Akatsuki did not know it, but they only pulled out the yin half. The yang half of the nine tails was buried deep within her and away from the other. When Datara removed half of it, he may have suspected that she split it, but they killed him before he could tell anyone, and as such, they only took half. She does state, though, that this gives them the advantage, as the Akatsuki don't know Kushina possesses a tailed beast anymore, which they could use to retaliate when the time is right. Sasuke eventually wakes up in the hospital, and by his side is Sakura, who is sleeping by his bedside, his hand in hers. At first, he blushes and considers taking it back, but one of the nurses sees this and smiles at him. She saved your life. If she hadn't shown up and found the antidote, you would be worm chow, bud. The nurse walks out. Sasuke looks down at her and suddenly feels a jolt through his solar plexus as a chill runs down his spine. He doesn't pull his hand away. Instead, he grips onto hers gently. Sakura seems to wake from this ever so slight action and looks up to see him sitting up in bed, smiling at her. Tears form in her eyes as she hugs him. Sasuke, she cries out, her emotions overwhelming her. I'm so glad you're okay, she says. He reciprocates the hug. She had never felt that before. He hugs onto her, his arms growing tighter. She holds him close. At the door, Itachi watches with a big grin on his face. As soon as Sasuke looks to him, Itachi's eyes show a light of understanding within them, as he shushes himself and closes the door to let them have their moment. Kushina and Tsunade begin to discuss their next moves. An emergency five Kage summit is called, and while there, Kushina meets with the other Kage, each which are slightly suspicious of her, save Gara, who vouches for her. That doesn't mean much coming from the Kage of Sunagakure, but then again, Kirigakure, aka Blood Mist Village, couldn't judge them and it was still fresh on everyone's mind, and the Hyuga affair that Kumo had partaken in was still fresh in everyone's mind. Everyone had blood on their hands, and things they wished they hadn't done, Kushina said, but she reminded them that the Akatsuki were a legitimate threat, not only to Konoha, but to every shinobi nation. They were gathering up-tailed beasts, and attempting to use them for some nefarious plot that they had yet to uncover. Disagreements continued, as well as accusations, after it was pointed out that Kiri had utilized the Akatsuki in the past. However, Meitarumi, the fifth Mizukage, bucked back by reminding him that the Akatsuki were utilized under Yagura, and that she had been trying to undo all the damage he had done to the village. Their bickering was cut short by the arrival of a certain man who appeared out of nowhere. Kushina turned around and her heart almost stopped. The messy hair, the black cloak, the orange mask. She gulped as suddenly every emotion struck her at once and her tongue went dumb. He looked down at her, his Sharingan staring straight into her soul. My my, if it isn't Kushina Uzumaki. It's been a while, Jinchuriki of the Nine Tails. Or should I say, former Jinchuriki. How did you survive that? She couldn't move. 
She couldn't look away. In that moment, she was back there, feeling the pain of just having given birth, all while having her body chained to that rock, feeling as if her insides were being shredded as the Ninetales chakra was ripped out of the open seal in her stomach. She had never felt so sick until then, and never since. Not until now, when all the symptoms were returning. Was this a genjutsu? She saw Minato's face. She felt his life leave him. All those wounds reopened. She almost collapsed, hitting the chair. Oh, are we feeling a little woozy? He laughed at her. The Raikage stood, his fist striking the table. What do you want? Have you come here just to die? Toby sat there, his legs swinging off his perch. No, I've come to make an ultimatum. Present to me the one tail and the eight tails, and your lives will be spared. And if we refuse? Onoki, the Sujikage asked. Toby would smile under his mask. You don't want to refuse. In a flash, A was in front of Toby, attempting to strike him. However, his fist passed clean through without a mark. What? Toby would waggle his finger. Tisk, tisk, tisk. I suppose it's war then. I will have those tailed beasts. Then he disappeared. Kushina sat in the chair, breathing deeply, hyperventilating. She almost puked. Tsunade rushed to her side. Lady Kushina! Kushina gripped Tsunade's shoulder as Tsunade helped her sit straight. Kushina looked to Tsunade. What is this? Poison? Genjutsu? Tsunade looked at her. No, I, I believe it's post-traumatic stress boiling to the surface. Kushina looked at her. What? I'm scared? Suddenly she puked. Gara offered her some respect by looking away. The other Kage were not so respectful. At that moment, the question of whether or not they wanted to work together had already passed. They had to. The new question was who should lead them. All the other Kage automatically nominated themselves. They began to question and accuse each other, trying to gain reason. In the end, the Raikage pounded the table with his fist again. It should be me. He pointed around the table. I dare any of you to disagree. He pointed to Onoki. He's too old to make an effective leader. His back will give out before he issues the first order. He pointed to Gara. He's too young. His inexperience will get us all killed the moment the first battle begins. He pointed at Mei. Not a single one of us trust her. Rumors fly around that the Akatsuki was originated from Kirigakure. And lastly, he pointed at Kushina. Need I say the reason why she shouldn't lead us against the orange masked man? He looked around the table. I am the only one of us that actually took initiative to attack that man. Onoki would reply to him. Yeah, and you failed too. He would snarl at Onoki. I did not fail, I learned. He has some jutsu that makes him intangible when struck. That's intelligence on the enemy right there. Now when we go to war with him, we can plan around that. The other Kage began to war amongst themselves, Gara merely pulling his hat down to cover his eyes, recusing himself from the argument as it would make no difference what he said to them. Kushina, having recovered from her panic attack, turned around. He's right. The entire room fell silent as even Gara raised his hat. Kushina spoke again. Lord Raikage is correct. His assumptions are blunt, but they're spot on. What we need now isn't a struggle for power, but unity. And so, I have chosen to nominate the Raikage as the leader of our allied shinobi forces. Gara would look around the table. I've witnessed enough of Kushina to trust her judgments. I too nominate the Raikage to be our leader. A would nod. Perhaps I misjudged you, Gara of the Hidden Sand. Outnumbered in the vote, and knowing that Kushina was correct, as division now would only cause their forces to falter, the other two Kage consented. In that moment, the allied shinobi forces were born. Returning to Konoha, Tsunade advised Kushina to rest, but she refused, going straight to work in rallying the forces of Konoha. She would immediately visit Suna to plan with Gara. While in Suna, Gara would welcome her as he too was rallying his forces. She asked Gara of his intentions. He stated that his elders have told him that the most important thing is that they don't get a hold of his tailed beast. He theorized that they might need the help of Shukaku, but he was told that with two of the three legendary Sanin in the forces, along with Kushina, that they would be able to stand against the tailed beasts. Just as he was saying that, something profound happened. Something passed between the two of them. Something very small and fast. So much so that they could barely see it. For a second, he wondered if it might be a bug. Looking down, they noticed that there was a pure splat on the ground. Where did that come from? Gara asked. Three more splats landed there as well. Gara looked up to the skies as clouds rolled in. Holding out his hand, he felt another drop hit him. Rain? He found this peculiar as the skies had been clear but a moment earlier. It never rains in Suna. Suddenly, Kushina and Gara's eyes met. 
A moment later, there was an explosion as a massive centipede appeared out of nowhere. In the skies above, Payne hovered, looking down on the village. He was there for the one tail and he would not leave without it. The rain began to pour and suddenly Payne turned his head in their direction, having found his target with it. Holding out his hand, he utilized a powerful Shinra Tensei to decimate that entire part of the village. Gara threw himself on Kushina and utilized the sand in his gourd to cover them as the sound of rubble passed over. When all was calm, Gara used his sand jutsu to free them. Pulling his head out, he witnessed the devastation. His anger boiled over as his village was slowly being ripped apart by an unknown adversary. Gara, in anger, called out to Shukaku and transformed into the One Tail. If you want my tailed beast, you're going to have to take it from me, he shouted. Gara attempted to attack Pain, but the deluge of rain that had fallen coated the sand and made it wet. This impacted his ability to use it properly. Sakura quickly ran to Kushina to help her up as Sasuke and Naruto appeared with Itachi. The various paths of Pain appeared and prepared to fight them. Kushina utilized her version 2 form. Getting down on all fours, four tails appeared behind her back as her hair spiked outward. She rushed Pain crawling up Shukaku and using him as a perch. Gara was still present in the forehead of the tailed beast and he looked to her. Kushina, are you still in there? She looked over at Gara and nodded. Once close enough, she attempted to jump out at pain, but the diva path pushed her back. She landed once more on Shukaku as it raised its hand to fire ball after ball of sand at Pain. He destroyed one, then he destroyed two, but suddenly Kushina had been thrown at him. She struck him, pulling him out of the sky and onto the ground. Naruto, utilizing Sage Mode, and Itachi with his dead eye replaced with Shisui's would engage the enemy, as Sasuke would follow in his brother's footsteps. However, the animal path attempted to use Fuinjutsu to rip the tailed beast out of Gara. Sakura, however, utilized her adamantine chains to grip Shukaku as well. Both Sakura and the animal path were fighting over the same thing, and though he was strong, Sakura could easily match with her strength of a hundred seal. Pulling together, the tailed beast chakra was shredded in two, not too unlike how Kushina had shred Kurama into a yin and yang half. Animal Path took one of the halves while the other remained with Gara. He thanked Sakura for saving his life. She told him it was no issue. Rejoining the battle, they easily had these six paths of pain matched. Kushina, however, was having issues facing pain. It was only after the other Paths of Pain were defeated that they could team up together and manage to kill the Diva Path. It was then that Gara utilized his sand to sense where the true body of Pain was located. Upon finding him, Gara, with his old self returning a bit, would slaughter Nagato mercilessly. Conan attempted to stop him, but she was overwhelmed by Team 7 and had to make an escape. Returning to Suna, they began to work on search and rescue. Tsunade was even called in to help with the injured. There were many casualties, but because of their quick action, many people survived. Knowing that time was of the essence, they began sending more and more spies out to survey the area, looking for the Akatsuki. Upon finding them, Kushina would mobilize with the other great nations and would set out to war. Gara also decided to come, as this had become very personal. For a time, they had issue discovering who was or wasn't a Zetsu, as the Zetsu had begun to infiltrate. However, with the help of Kushina's ability to sense emotions, something she gained from Kurama's power, they're able to weed out this enemy. Making it to the theater of the war's climax, they would face an army of Zetsu and the remainder of the Akatsuki. But among them all was Tobi, who Kushina was dreading seeing the most. The entire time, she worked herself up, hyped up her anger and downplayed her fear. But looking into his twisted Mongekyo Sharingan again, she felt sick. Holding tight, she attempted to attack him anyway. She channeled all of her rage into her attacks, but none of them connected, her fear leaving her feeling sick, like she was dying. Naruto came to her side. Mom, let me help with this guy. Standing between Tobi and she, Kurama could have sworn he was looking at Minato, but it wasn't. It was Naruto, still wearing a similar red haori as Jiraiya. He rushed out to face Tobi in Sage Mode, but none of his attacks hit. Rasengan after Rasengan continued to pass through Tobi. Kushina was startled. Was there nothing she could do? Naruto was knocked down. She saw Tobi as he pulled his scythe that remained chained to his Bansho fan. He flung it at Naruto. How she got there, she didn't know. All she knew was that she was right where she meant to be. Standing between Naruto and the scythe. The blade passed into her chest and she hit the ground. Mom! Naruto shouted as he crawled over. Mom! She slowly felt herself slipping. She rubbed her hand across his cheek. Have I ever told you that you look like your father? She then closed her eyes and fell back. Mom! Naruto stood and rushed Tobi again. It was all dark, but she felt a subtle warmth. Opening her eyes, she saw her reflection on the ground. Where am I? She asked. Right here, with me. A set of arms wrapped around her waist from behind as a head rested on her shoulder to give her a kiss on the cheek. Minato, but how? Am I dead? No. I can't be. You're here. Wait, how are you here? You're in the Shinigami. Minato looked at his wife. 
I sealed the portion of my chakra into you when I sealed away the Nine Tails. I wanted to be here with you when you left this world. She looked down, so I did die. He shook his head. No, not yet, but you're on your way. He looked to her. You have the power to beat him. Why don't you? She began to tear up. Because I'm scared. I'm terrified. He's the reason. The reason you almost died, he asked, attempting to finish her question. She turned to him. No, the reason you did die. Minato looked at her as she spoke, tears streaking down her cheeks. The day you died was simultaneously the best and worst of my life. I became a mother, she said with a smile, but then the smile faded to sorrow as she continued to cry. A single mother. Minato held her close. No, Kushina. You're so much more than that now. You're not just Naruto's mother, you're Sasuke's mother too. You're the Hokage. You discovered the truth behind the Uchiha massacre and turned the village on its head. Your strength makes you so much more than you think. It's the reason why I married you. The reason why I love you. She buried her head into his shoulder. I've been lost without you, Minato. He held her close. But you're not without me. You never were. I will always be with you. You saved the village so many times. Now I need you to do it one last time. Save it and the world and prove that the first woman Hokage is the best Hokage of them all, just as you dreamed to do all those years ago. And know that when you do, I'll be there with you. In the real world, Sakura was attempting to heal Kushina, but wasn't getting anywhere. Please, Kushina, don't die. You promised me that we would still have that ladies' night out. If you die now, I'll never forgive you. She poured everything she could into it. Please! Suddenly, the wound closed and her eyes shot open. There was a jolt of chakra as she stood. She looked down to see that a cloak covered her, the cloak made of pure orange-tailed beast chakra. Her skin, her hair, everything was burning with the Ninetales life force. The entire battle seemed to stop to see this one moment. She looked up to Toby and suddenly she dashed forward. But before she struck him, her body flickered and she was behind him, attempting to strike. Her leg came around and smashed him in the back of the head. Kushino looked on. Huh. So you're not always intangible. You have to turn it on. She rushed forward, utilizing the new speed boost that this chakra mode gave her to strike Toby in the stomach. It was so fast, he couldn't accurately use Kamui. He fell back with the final strike. He stood as his mask crumbled away. Kushina's eyes lightened with revelation. Obito? He sneered. Obito died a long time ago, he said. He died with Rin, but he will live again, as soon as she does in my infinite moon dream. He then summoned the ghetto statue to him. It made room for him, striking out at all the others. He then summoned the Horn of the Eight Tails. This was found in one of the layers left behind by Orochimaru, so imagine my surprise that it had exactly what I needed. He gave the horn to the ghetto statue and watched as it transformed into the Ten Tails. He would then proceed to absorb it into himself. For a moment, he felt as if he would come apart, but upon controlling it, he felt the power rushing through him. Deciding he had enough of this fight, he hovers in the air and forms a massive tailed beast bomb, and prepares to throw it to destroy the entirety of the allied shinobi forces. Kushina called for Sakura, and together they use their adamantine chains to weave a barrier to protect them. The bomb strikes it, and the energy nearly blows everyone off their feet as the ground rumbles with the magnitude of the explosion. Kakashi is startled by this revelation. Itachi stands before Kushina. She looks to him. Please, Itachi. He was a friend. I can't kill him. We have to save him. In that moment, Itachi understood. Kushina looked down as she braced and protected them from another tailed beast bomb with Sakura's help. Remind him of who he was and who he can be again. Itachi nodded. And the moment they had the chance, Itachi formed his Susanoo and engaged with Obito. Obito was too strong though. He broke through Itachi's Susanoo and pushed him to the ground. Straddling him and choking him, he looked at Itachi. As strong as you are, you dirty traitor, what can you do to stop a god? Itachi opened his eyes. Koro Amatsukami. Suddenly, Obito was forced to relive his childhood, his love of Rin, and then was posed with a question. No told a fact. Is this what Rin would want? It was as if a veil was lifted from his eyes and he finally saw the world clearly. Itachi's face was reddened as he fought for breath. Obito stood and stepped back. I'm sorry. Itachi began to breathe as Sasuke rushed to him and pulled him away. Obito looked down to his hands and then up at the others and then to the moon. What have I done? What did I do? Kushina sighed in relief and with that, the battle was over. Now, if you think that Obito would never face justice, you're wrong. 
Given that he was now the most powerful man on the face of the planet, they couldn't just let him roam around. But at the same time, Kushina knew that he wouldn't be much of a danger, so she offered him plenty of freedoms as long as he remained within the confines of the prison. Obito was happy to oblige, knowing that he was the cause of all of this. However, Kushina was drained from this whole ordeal. She found herself sitting at her desk. She turned around and looked over the village and realized just how far she had come. She had done right by the Uchiha. She had done right by Sasuke. She had done right by Itachi. She had done right by Hiruzen. So much had changed for her, yet so much remained the same. She left her office and stood out on the balcony of the residence and just looked up at the Hokage Monument, the face of every Hokage in history watching over their village eternally. And sitting there, right beside Minato's face, was Kushina's. He was always with her and always would be. The answers she sought were sitting so obviously in front of her and she hadn't even seen it until now, but all good things had to come to an end. To be frank, she was tired. Everything she had done, experienced, it was all getting to be so much. She was beginning to long for that time that she was just a simple housewife, dreaming of motherhood. She began to think that it was time to go back to that. She looked out over the village once more. Minato, I hope you see this. I hope you're proud. I love you. After this, she passed the Hokage title to Tsunade. She wasn't super interested in it, but she knew that Kushina deserved her rest, so she promised to hold the position until Naruto could take it. She also commanded that her face on the monument be beside Hashirama, so that the place beside Kushina could be open for Naruto. She believed that family should remain together no matter where they were, and that went for herself and her grandfather, Hashirama, too. Kushina would still have those ladies' nights out with Tsunade and Sakura. And eventually, when she came of age, Tsunade made good on her promise and took her to the largest casino in all of the Land of Fire. Sakura swept the house. It made for a good nest egg now that she and Sasuke were getting married. Kushina couldn't be happier, being the bridesmaid of such a beautiful young woman. She cried more than a little on their marriage day. She remembered back to that scared, closed-off boy that Sasuke used to be, and then looked at the smiling, laughing man he had become and could see a very clear difference. It didn't take Naruto long to find love either. He found it with the daughter of Hiyashi Hyuga, her old council member and friend. As times passed though, various issues cropped up and Kushina would be called back to help handle it, such as the threat of Taneri, Momoshiki, and Ishiki. However, her decisions she made in the past all proved to be good ones, as Obito, ever eager to prove himself, was capable of putting down each and every one of these threats with Naruto's help. And yes, eventually Naruto did become Hokage. Kushina would also be blessed to see her grandson and granddaughters, as not only did Naruto and Hinata produce Boruto and Himawari, but Sasuke and Sakura had produced Sarada. These moments were her golden years and they felt every ounce like gold. Witnessing the birth and lives of her children, she was blessed to get this far. If only Minato could have been there with her. But then again, he always was and always would be. And that, my friends, brings the story of Kushina as Hokage to a close. If Kushina had never died, this sort of story is one I could easily see taking place. I'm glad you all enjoyed this series. It was a pleasure to make. Did you enjoy our video? Well, then be sure to check out these other great videos from the Amagi. And make sure to subscribe and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos.